Um, so welcome to the session. I'm very happy and very proud uh, to present some of my friends and colleagues of the University of Costa Rica. Uh, first of all, of all, I would like to say thank you to the organizers for inviting us um, to share some of the research that the female professors of the University of Costa Rica has been working on uh, during the last years. Um, Costa Rica, as maybe, maybe you know, uh, as a Central American country, stands out in among other countries of the region uh, in some areas as, for example, social, economic, educational and health uh, topics. However, the, these four studies, as my colleagues are going to present, um, show some gender disparities in, in, this, in these areas. So this is um, like a close up in some uh, very important topics um, in our country and how these gender disparities are, uh, are affecting us. And, and also this, of course, through a statistical analysis, very high quality uh, research, all of them. Um, so I would like to first to introduce the first speaker, uh, it's Hazel um, Quesada Leiton. Um, she uh, she aimed a Bachelor of Statistics from the University of Costa Rica. She is currently a lecturer at this university since 2020. Uh, she has been also a researcher at the Health Institute Research uh, since 2018. And also she has worked at the Central American Center of Population. Um, she is a co-author in for research uh, for scientific publications. Um, her areas of work include generalized linear mix models, survival analysis, patient statistics, and her principal areas of research are related also to the um, health field. Uh, the title of her presentation is Women's Participation in Pap Smear Screening in a Developing Country, Evidence for Improving Health Systems. Um, so thank you, Hazel, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alejandra. And I'm going to present my presentation. And well, first of all, I would like to say good afternoon to everyone and happy day to every woman in statistics. And I don't know what is happening with my presentation. Okay, that's fine. How Alessandra, how Alexandra, Alejandra, sorry, was saying my topic is women's participation in pap smear screening in a developing country. More specifically, here in Costa Rica, evidence for improving health systems. My name is Hazel Quesada Leiton, and I'm here to present an investigation I did with Carolina Santa Maria, Melina Lopez, and Ileana Quiroz. These are the contents of the presentation. And as part of the scenario we face in America, it's important to highlight that every year about 80. 3,000 women are diagnosed with cervical cancer in the Americas in general, and about 30, 36,000 of them die because this condition. That is why this is the first common cancer in 11 countries and the second most common in another 12 countries. And here in Costa Rica and in Latin and Central America is a third female incident cancer. There are some social determinants that can explain how women with disadvantaged life conditions, such as women living in developing countries, are at a greater risk of cervical cancer. And those social determinants can be divided in two specific factors, individual factors and structural factors. Individual factors, such as health behavior, cultural beliefs or education, and structural factors, such as socioeconomic status, factors related to access to healthcare system or gender inequalities. It's important to highlight that some individual factors and also some structural factors can be modifiable. The structural factors can be modifiable based on evidence such as this investigation, but some of them cannot be addressed by screening programs. And According to the World Health Organization, an integral control of cervical cancer should include three different levels of action. The first one is the primary prevention that includes sexual education programs and vaccination against human papillomavirus. At the secondary prevention level, we have screening strategies such as cytology or pap smear screening and treatment of precancerous lessons. And as a tertiary prevention level, we have diagnosis and treatment of 
invasive cancer, but more specifically, cervical invasive cancer. <clears throat> Here in Costa Rica, the Costa Rican Social Security Fund is the national entity responsible for care provision. And they have been taking different actions for the last decades to strengthen prevention and treatment of cervical cancer. In 2007, national guidelines were published with the aim of providing a woman a better access to cervical cancer prevention and standardizing healthcare. And as a result of these national guidelines, published in 2007, every woman uh, 20 years or older must be conducted every two years above ESMIR. Those women are older than 20 years and they have ever had coital intercourse. They have to be conducted or they have to be conducted this pop ESMIR screening regardless of their insurance status. The objective of the present investigation was determine, determine predictors of participation in pap smear screening among Costa Rican women with a special focus on women who have ever who have never had a pap smear or have had it five or more years ago. As part of the methodology, we use uh, the data from Costa Rican Households National Survey conducted in 2014 and was conducted by the National Institute of, Cost of Statistics and Census. More specifically, we use a subsample of women aged between 20 to 69 years old. They answered the pop smear, the pop smear model. We use a weight factor to weight the sample because we want to maintain the national representative. And this weight factor allow to keep the representative of the characteristics on which the sample estimation was based without expanding the number of observations. And as part of the dependent variables, we have two different dependent variables because we estimated two multinomial regression models. For the first regression model, the dependent variable was time elipse, elipse since the last pap smear with the following categories, less than two years, one to less than two years, that was the reference category for this model, two to three years, three to less than five years, and five to more years. This reference category was, was just because it was the, the optimal time. And reasons to have never had a pop smear, and which categories was cultural, non-active non sexual life, as a reference category, economical difficulties, health system access issues, and other reasons. Those categories didn't exist. We made it based on the opinion of, of different experts on the on the area. And the independent independent variables were sociodemographic variables such as age, educational attainment with the following categories, and marital status. Marital status was divided into different categories in partnership. Those women were married or in union and not in partnership, single or not in union. As I was saying, a multinomial regression model was estimated where Y represents the dependent variable, J represents the different categories of the dependent variable mentioned before. X represent the independent variables and beta represent the different coefficients associated with the independent variables. To do the analysis, we use the software R and it's important to highlight that this specific model, multinomial regression model, can be understood as a generalization of the logistic regression model where the dependent variable has different uh, levels and one of these levels is the reference category. For the first case, for the first dependent variable, at the first stage, we estimated an ordinal regression model because this variable has an order itself, but the odd, odds proportional assumption was not filled out. So we estimated the multinomial regression model. And for the second dependent variable, 
the multinomial regression model was the first option because the variable didn't have an order itself. As part of the results that we get on this investigation, we have 70% of the women had their less uh, vaginal cytology less than two years ago, according to the National Guidelines published in 2007. This means that 70% of the women are using the cytology in a correct, in a correct way. And also we have that women who had never had a cytology were younger than the population at a lever had a higher educational attainment and a, a higher proportion of them were single or not in a domestic relationship. In contrast, women who had who have had a pap smear five or more years ago were older than the population, have a, had a lever, had a lower educational attainment, and a similar proportion of them were married or single. As a result of the first model, we have that women with incomplete primary were more likely than women with college or higher level of education of never had a pap smear or having had it five years ago or longer, greater than one, two years ago. That means that women with a incomplete primary education or a lower educational attainment were more likely of using in a bad way the, the cytology rather than using in a correct way if we compare them with women with a high educational attainment. And also, the older the women get, the more likely they are of having a pap smear five years ago or longer. That means the older the women are, the, the more likely they are to use the cytology in a bad way. <laughs> As part of the results of the second model, we have that the older the women get, the more likely they are of not having had the pap smear for other reasons different from not having an active sexual life. More specifically, each increase of a year was associated with a 7% 7 increase of never having a pap smear because uh, because of healthcare system access issues. And also an increment of a year was associated with the increase in the odds of never having a pap smear because cultural reasons. <clears throat> Besides, women with lower educational levels presents an increase in the odds of had never having a pap smear for economic reasons compared to never having, never having have never having had an active sexual life. As part of the results, two different uh, populations can be identified as target population for interventions here in Costa Rica. The first profile is young woman, woman under the to 30 years old, single or not united with the high educational level. They are more likely than never having a hat uterine cytology perform. And the other profile are women, older women, sorry, over 50 years old, married or in union with a low educational attainment. They are more likely to have had less cytology five or five years ago or more. So here in Costa Rica, the strategies must focus on the two groups mentioned before, using different strategies for both of them. For the first group, Costa Rica must focus their strategies on boost participation in cytology. And for the second group, Costa Rica must focus uh, their strategies to continue having the exam. In Costa Rica and also Latin American and Caribbean countries, age and educational level have been important determinants to predict the participation of the woman in the relation of pap smear screening not only here in Costa Rica, also in other countries. And between women over 50 years of age in union, they have been more likely to not participate in, in uh, cytology, also in Costa Rica, but 
in Latin American countries for marital status or for this kind of uh, situation. In other, in other investigation, marital status has been identified as a barrier to having such an exam, not only here in Costa Rica. So we can conclude that there are different factors that can explain how inequalities affect the use of the uterine cytology. And those factors can be educational level, access to the health system, economic barriers, and also age. Thank you very much. This is my email where you can contact me if you have questions or you want the the uh, the link of the investigation. And this is the link of the investigation where you can find it on internet. Perfect. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you very much for the interesting this interesting um work. And now I would like to ask if there are some questions from the public, if someone has questions or I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, but uh, anyways, you can also email Hazel in case in case of questions. Um, if there is none, then I would like to move to Eliana, please, if you can um, start sharing your your screen and and prepare uh, your presentation. Yeah. Uh, do you see it? Oh, I'm sorry. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. We can see you, but not your presentation. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. But, but okay, uh, if you can share your screen, that would be great. In the okay. meantime, I will. Uh, I would like to to tell that Eliana attained a PhD in educational measurement and evaluation from the Florida State University, uh, also a Bachelor of Statistics from the University of Costa Rica. Uh, currently, Eliana is a retired professor. She worked at the School of Statistics of our university and also as a researcher at the Institute of Psychological Research. Um, she has also been a professor in several master programs. The American Statistical Association awarded her with a distinction Educational Ambassador 2010-2011. Um, she is the author or the, or the co-author of more than 40 scientific publications. Her areas of work include mixed model, structural equation models, program impact evaluation and construction and validation of instruments and standardized tests with the aim of promoting educational excellence and in, in equity. Um, we are very, very happy uh, to have Eliana here. Uh, so Eliana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am very happy to be here with all of you and especially with the other um, the other opponents uh, that are my colleagues. And I think I was the professor of many of, of them. So it's uh, very nice to have this kind of activities and to promote the participation of women in statistics and in all fields that are STEM. So uh, this is a research that was uh, carried out uh, a few years ago. Uh, um, the name of the of the study is like like is in the title: "Expected and Unexpected Effects of Sexism on Women's Math Performance in a Standardized Test." And this is a research that was done uh, uh, for uh, by a team of researchers from three, three different public universities, University of Costa Rica, the Institute of Technology, and the National University in my country. Uh, the first person listed there, Vanessa Smith, was the lead researcher, was the principal investigator. She's a, a social psychologist, and she was the, the person who developed the causal model, the theoretical model that we wanted to, to confirm or we wanted to generate evidence. And um, I am the second one. Tania Elena Moreira is the Institute of Technology and Jose Andres Zamora, who is the, the only male in the group, is from the National University. So this is uh, this this um, uh, study was published in the in, in nineteen uh, in twenty nineteen in twenty nineteen in the Interamerical uh, Psychology Journal. Uh, so um, why is important to study the the these differences 
that always in Costa Rica are in favor of males in math standardized tests. Uh, always has been like that <laughs> since I can remember, since it is documented. But the problem is that right now, it seems that these differences are going higher, bigger, are getting bigger instead of getting uh, uh, low. Um, there are several hypotheses, but so um, with the admission test at the universities and the diagnostic diagnostic test that we do in the universities with the standardized test in the math component, we always see a high effect sizes in favor of males. And also in the PISA test, this international program, a PISA test, a Costa Rica is one of the countries that have ha, has the highest differences between men and women in uh, approximately 60, 60 plus uh, countries that participate in PISA. Costa Rica is one of the countries with the highest difference in uh, between men and women in math and in science. And also related to this uh, uh, is the fact that less than 30% of professionals in STEM in science, technology, engineering, and math are women. And it seems that this gap is widening. Uh, so uh, some hypotheses um, of why is uh, happening. So probably they are also uh, local conditions related to the inequality in this country. Some of us believe that uh, the more unequal a country is, the more unequal is also um, is expressed in their mo more vulnerable people. But at this particular study, we focus, we focus in other constructs that certainly are very important here and in many other countries. Uh, we focus in three particular constructs as predictors of a women performance in math tests, math, uh, uh, math tests that are standardized. We focus in math self-efficacy or self-confidence that is also called. Uh, so how, how much confidence I have that I am good in math? Uh, is a very, very important construct. Uh, Self-efficacy is a predictor for many, many different areas. Um, we also uh, focus in gender stereotypes. For example, the stereotype threat. Uh, in this case, is because generally math is, uh, is viewed as a male uh, natural field. So th that math, math is natural for men, but it's not natural for women. So this kind of a stereotype. And also the sexist ideologies, the ideologies that establish differences uh, between men and, and women um, at the ideological level. Our starting point, actually, this is the starting point of our lead researcher, Vanessa Smith. She's the one who structured uh, this uh, Causal model. Uh, the starting point is that the um, internalization of sexist belief systems and negative gender stereotypes can affect math self efficacy. So, sexist beliefs uh, affect, have a causal effect on uh, math self efficacy, which is in turn, uh, which in turn affects women performance in a standardized math test. So, these models are only for women to explain the performance of women in a standardized math, math test. And there are two important um, um, dimensions here in terms of, of the sexist ideologies. Uh, we use a construct that is called ambivalent sexism. Ambivalent sexism has two components, the hostility component and the benevolence uh, component. This theory is from uh, Glick and Fisk, these authors, and uh, the hostility component has to do with a negative view of women, 
uh, as wanting to gain power over men, targets women who, who threaten the status quo and do not adhere uh, to traditional roles. That is a hostile perspective. And the, the benevolent perspective, which is the other side of the coin, but it's also sexism, is a, a paternalistic vision of women, protectionist and affectionate, conceiving them as wonderful but weak creatures. It rewards women who fit traditional role. That means subordinate to men. I think we all, as women, have experienced this kind of sexism, right? Okay, according to the theory that was uh, developed by our lead researcher, this is the theoretical causal model uh, that uh, fits into this hypothesis. There is the exogenous uh, latent variables. The exogenous latent variables are hostile sexism and benevolent sexism. They have indicators. This is a structural equation model. They, they affect directly the belief system in uh, the equity of men uh, and, and men and women in mad abilities. And in turn, this belief, the, this equity belief, beliefs affect self-efficacy in mad context and self-efficacy affect, affects directly the performance in the standardized mad test. So this is the uh, cow, cows, cows, the causal link that is established by the theory, but also as you can see uh, here, I don't, don't know if you can see my my cursor, uh, but this is a, a general reasoning ability construct that is very important to control. Of course, it's very important in the case of math test controlled by general reasoning abilities that we know by theory that are also related to to the performance. So this is a, a con control uh, variable that is measured by a, a scale, a, a test, a, a exam of fluid intelligence. So uh, how we measure these constructs? Uh, as I said before, the general reasoning ability was measured by uh, a test uh, of fluid intelligence, which is basic um, abilities, uh, for reasoning uh, that was developed in, in our institute, in institute, institute for Psychological Research. Um, uh, and now uh, talking about uh, the sexism, remember there are two types of sexism, the hostile and the benevolent sexism. They both have scales. These are scales uh, like it, like it, five point scales. Uh, each one of these scales have between 10 and, and 13 items. Uh, there is also the gender equity scale, gen gender equity in math context, the math self-efficacy or self-confidence scale, and uh, the very final endogenous variables are uh, indicators of performance in math standardized tests. Uh, one is the correct percent correct in the math component of the admission test at the University of Costa Rica, and the other one is the percent correct in the math test of the secondary school exit exam. Because in Costa Rica at that time, every student at the end of the secondary school, at the end of high school, they had to, to take this uh, test. And in this particular case, uh, we only had the math component as an indicator. So this is an example of an item from the fluid intelligent test. Uh, these tests are similar to Cattell or Raven. So you have to uh, you you have to identify which is the figure that follows in, in the question mark. This is a kind of uh, task that are involved in the in this fluid intelli intelligent test. And these are some examples of the items in the hostility scale and in the benevolent scale. So you can see some, some of the items, for example, in the hostility, women exaggerate the problems they have at work. And in the benevolent, women are characterized by a purity that few men possess. So that type of thing. Of course, these scales were uh, 
prior prior to this research, these scales were calibrated psychometrically and they have good properties. And the gender equity, the gender equity in math context, math context have this type of items. Women are as good as men at calculus. To solve important math progress, I will trust a woman as much as I will trust a man. Uh, men enjoy math as much as women. So this is gender equity in math context, some examples. And finally, the uh, math self-efficacy uh, or self-confidence, uh, these are all, uh, the authors when Emma and Sherman. Examples of these items, I'm sure I can learn math. I'm not the type of person who does well in math. I am confident in myself when I solve math exercises. So we use a uh, um, estimation of the structural equation models. We have three independent sub subsamples that we analyze separately. We analyze separately these three, three different subsamples. A sample of high school, uh, th these are all um, random samples. Um, high school women is one sample. Another sample is university majors in social sciences and humanity. And the other one is university majors in STEM, in STEM majors. Estimation method was maximum likelihood, and we use the least real software. So this is the um, descriptive statistics. They are in the paper, but um, anyway, uh, you can see them in, in the paper, and they they behave very well because they are, these are scales that were were calibrated before. And this this is the estimation for for the model, a structural equation model uh, for the high school girls. As you can see, uh, the coefficients, these are all standardized coefficients, by the way. Uh, all of the coefficients are, uh, are um, higher than 0.1 in absolute value. And also they are statistically significant and they are in the direction that was expected by the theory. The only thing that is different from the theory uh, that our researcher Vanessa established at first was this, this direction. This is a direct effect from equity to, to performance in math that was not considered in the uh, original theory, but when we, we saw this, um, this finding, we realized that, um, that in general, yes, the theory, the theory is also consistent with a direct effect between, between equity and math. And all the other paths are um, estimated as predicted by the theory. Now we see the case of the uh, university majors, the, the women who are majoring, uh, who are already in the university, they are majoring in social sciences or humanities. Here, the, um, the goodness of fit is a little less. It's not as good fit as the high school girls. And there are some coefficients that are not, uh, they, they don't, don't get, don't, uh, don't get the, the threshold value of point, uh, point 0.1 in absolute value. There are uh, a couple of coefficients who, um, which don't have, the, don't reach the, the threshold value. And now, finally, the university women who are in STEM majors. Uh, so uh, there is also a coefficient here who is not, uh, who uh, which, which doesn't reach the 0.1 value. So um, the, the, the goodness of fit indices are a little less optimal in these cases also. There is, there was one important surprise. The important su surprise was that in order to uh, validate the model, we also had to test paths, um, the, the sum of the paths were not direct. So in the other two samples, in the high school sample and in the sample of a university majors in social sciences and, uh, and um, humanities, we don't. We didn't have any uh, this problem, but in the case of the STEM majors, women who are measuring 
me majoring in STEM careers. It so happens that we found when we, we were doing th this test, the test for, uh, for uh, null hypothesis of uh, uh, zero direct paths, we found this value of 0.32, uh, 32, which is a high value uh, in standardized terms between hostile sexism and math performance is positive which means, and that's why we got so surprised, means that women who are in STEM majors and have high uh, levels of hostile sexism have, tend to have better math scores in this standardized math test. So we were very surprised and this is something that we need to study more, of course. But um, now that I go to the conclusions. Uh, among the high school girls, they data showed the expected indirect effect of math gender stereotypes on math achievement uh, via math, math self-efficacy. So this uh, indirect effect was confirmed uh, among university students, uh, model adjustment was somehow less optimal, as we saw. And uh, an an unexpected positive relationship between hostile sexism and math performance in STEM fields emerge. Uh, another conclusion is that our analysis provides evidence for the theoretical model being tested in the in the uh, for for the most part. Uh, there is evidence for, for the model uh, we tested. Uh, uh, now, this surprising factor, uh, the, um, this, uh, this positive relationship between hostile sexism and math performance in the women who are majoring in STEM could be a reflection. Uh, th these are just uh, hypotheses, hypotheses that we have could be a reflection of the boys club mentality that prevails in STEM male dominated environments. The competitive climate of many STEM majors combined with the masculine language and culture that predominates there affect women's ability to fit within these majors. As some, some stayers, that means some women that stay in this major are able to persist because they take on more acceptable gender roles and, va and values. That is one hypothesis. The problem that we have with this hypothesis, we cannot test it with this data because these data as are cross-sectional, cross-sectional and re retrospective. So we need to do a longitudinal study in order to test this hypothesis. We need to take uh, girls very young when they are starting high school, for example, and follow them to see what happens, to see if these girls that are in, in STEM, they were already like that when they came to these majors or they started to, to think that way because of the climate, the culture, the male dominated culture that is present in this uh, in these environments. So uh, Elena, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we have like short time for the other two presentations. So I, I don't know if you have like uh, uh, no uh, is uh, I already finished. Meanwhile, promote gender equity in math context and promote math, math self-efficacy or self-confidence in women, especially is a good idea because they can make a difference. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I actually do have a couple of questions, but because of the time, I would like to uh, just send it to you <laughs> later. Okay. Um, uh, so Karen, in the meantime, maybe you can start sharing your screen, please. Um, so the next speaker is Karen Corrales. She attained a master's degree in statistics at the University of Costa Rica. Um, she works currently as a statistician in the public sector in the country on issues related to education, employment, health, environment, and the industry 4.0.
Um, her main areas of interest are data science, data science, employability indicators, college studies duration period analysis, employability of professional people, competencies and skills of university careers, careers, digital gaps, and all of these areas apply to connect decision makers with data. Uh, so, Karin, you can start. Thank you, Ale, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm grateful for the space to present my research, which is called Choice of Careers Among Graduates 2011-2013 from Costa Rica Universities. I will start with three questions that I asked to myself to carry out this research. The first one is, the, has the combination of people's university study ever been analyzed? Um, the second question is what information is available in Costa Rica on professionals? And the last one is how can I analyze the combination of careers using statistics? So, well, to ask the first question, um, what information is available in Costa Rica on professionals? In Costa Rica, there is an observatory at Conare um, whose name is Observatory of University Graduates Employability, um, OLAP in español, at the Spanish. Um, this observatory has information on professionals and employment. Um, maybe three topics that I choose is about the employability situation and employment characteristic of professionals um, aspects related to professional training. Also, in that period from 2011 to 2013, 167 people graduate from Costa Rican universities with two or more um, university degrees. So there are my participants of my research. Then um, I found and applied uh, these four techniques to, risk, to answer the second question, how can I analyze the combination of careers using statistics? So the four techniques that I choose uh, was a social network and hierarchical clustering, uh, modularity index and exponential um, random graph models. Uh, starting with a social uh, network. A uh, social network is defined by a series of actors between which certain relationships are established. These actors, also called nodes, are linked by a lines that reflect this, is re this relationship. Other researches said every day it's common to see social networks in everyday issues such as uh, being married to a person or living near a place and other aspects. <clears throat> a social network uh, essentially represents different actors or individuals on a daily basis. Um, the social network uh, has three important concepts. The first one is a node, the node um, which can represent different things maybe people, groups, institutions, movies, books, and other, among others. This allows to classify the network into several types according to the size and what this node represents. The second concept is our relationships. Um, the relationship is a dyadic connections between the actors and they can be directional or by a density. The directional ones consider two types of transitivity if the relationship is reciprocal or the direct one. And finally, the last concept is the network limits um, allowed to establish a criterion of membership of the network. As well as closer, it is based on two approaches. Uh, the first one is the realistic approach, uh, which is more associated with the expert criterion of the social event. 
And the last one is the nominalistic approach, which is associated with a reference frame of this network. Um, also, um, the social network uh, has metrics um, to evaluate the network and the social network um, in your global network metrics on or about the node. And this night that appear in this slide are the ones that were used of for the analysis. To continue with the other techniques, I use a hierarchical clustering using only regression trees or dendrograms. Um, with the uh, other technique is a modular index. This index is to, to is using, this is the formula, and is using to found the adequate partition. Um, to find the optimum partition, the index must have um, values greater than 0 0.7 to be considered an adequate partition. And the last technique that I use is an exponential random graph models. These models describe the network behavior and predict the formation structure of the social network. In this slide is the formula of the model and each of its parts. And perhaps the most important thing to mention is the agency matrix of the node uh, because it's the relationships or about our disciplines. So um, using these techniques, how did we apply them? Firstly, and construction of a direct network estimation of both local and global metrics. Um, about the nodes, in this case, is disciplines. And the second community, a uh, graphical analysis of, analysis of a dendrogram was performance and a hierarchical cluster, complement with the uh, modular index to find the partition. The last one is the exponential random graph model with the depth and variable is a um, discipline node and 15 uh, independent variables. Uh, these variables are associated with the characteristic of the job, and other are related with the academic part. What was obtained? What, well, in this slide is a hierarchical cluster of nodes by the discipline. Uh, as you can see, uh, here is a 12 partitions about the groups that I made with my, my social network and the modular index is uh, 0 0.84. So this number of modular index consider an adequate partition. In the next one, uh, with these partitions, we build the social network, show this slide, um, very different groups, some nodes, are bigger than others, as this reflects the most common relations, the most common relationships. For example, um, the group A with color with orange color is represented by archaical science and information technology. And other uh, bigger group is um, group D, which uh, French language teaching, language teaching, and French language. Um, some of these groups have very different careers inside, while others are composed of very similar careers. For example, the group F represents mostly the area of economics, with exception, with exception to careers. Uh, public health and occupational safety. To continue with the uh, metrics, network metrics, we can see we have an average distance of 1.6. That, that means the, short, the, the shortest distance to connect a pair of nodes. And the diameter is a four, which implies that is farthest node in four nodes away. The density uh, corresponds to all the possible connections of the nodes. In this case, for 
this result is 2.2%. As for transitive, transitive is the represents the proportion of trades which form the network is 7.7. .7. Also, there is a 0% and reciprocity. And since there are disconnect nodes, this reflects behavior of the study variable, which are university disciplines. Um, unlike other networks, this shows many disconnections, uh, which is turn reflects uh, that is not so easy to obtain several uh, diplomas in the period of three years, uh, which is our variable study. Then in this table, we observe the model's results and the variables of the model and the metrics of the model. I obtained 10 significant variables, which are represent in light blue color, and these variables are related to the job and academic lifestyles. To complement them, I make some box plot and only present this box plot about the employability indicators. Um, regarding to the employability indicators with group E, this group maintains little variability within these disciplines and also has a low indicators of unemployment and underemployment due to insufficient hours, thus demonstrating that continuation of studies was effective for employability and improvement in the working condition for individuals. And finally, what are the conclusions? Combination of studies, university study is present in a near half of disciplines in the study, mainly in the areas of economics and social science and education. The disciplines with the highest number of links correspond to archival science and information technology. The distance between the discipline is close to two. This means every two disciplines there is connection on the other hand, the first discipline is four disciplines away from the other. And um, with the construction, uh, almost 20 groups with different careers combinations. Um, the model has 10, 10 significant variables and the small groups show less variability, which represents two significant variables of the model and the bigger group size, the more variability in there is in the variables. So thank you everyone. And this is my contact information in case you need it. And the link to find my research. Thank you, Karen. Um, also very interesting. And I also have a couple of questions but then we'll be later because we have actually very short time for the last uh, presentation. So Eugenia, can you can you share your your screen? In the meantime, um, I would like present to I would like to present to Eugenia. She has a PhD in government and public policy from the University of Costa Rica and a master degree in statistics from the same university. Uh, currently, she is a professor at the Department of Statistics of the University of Costa Rica. In 2018, she was awarded with the Oscar Oslek Prize by the Inter American Network of Education in Public Administration. Um, her areas of interest include educational policy, data analysis, analytics, and higher education. Eugenia has uh, several scientific publications, mainly related to the topic higher education. So thank you, Eugenia, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandra. Uh, good afternoon from Costa Rica. I present the study difference in salary structure by gender at the University of Costa Rica. I made this study with Dr. Mauricio Molina. First, um, I will talk about the context due to change in the country's labor laws. In 2020, the University of Costa Rica decides to reduce its salary model 
the university is interested in a salary model that avoids uh, reproducing social inequalities. In this context, we decide in our study to focus on determining whether there were salary difference between men and women. Our objective was to analyze the gender wage gap in faculty and administrative position at the University of Costa Rica in the year 2020. Um, several students have found that education is reduced gender wage gaps. In despite of the large number of women graduate from higher education, women are still paid less than their male counterparts. According to some research, these gaps can be explained either at an individual uh, level where aspect of gender preference in the labor market or in relation to organizational structure and practice, we stand to penalize women. Okay, uh, our data correspond to the payroll for the months of August and November 2020, provided by the University of Costa Rica Human Resource Office. We use November data because according to the Human Resource Office, they are more stable. However, it is important to mention that August data show very similar results. Uh, we use multiple linear regression and quantile regression models to identify possible associated factors, including employment status, the labor sector, the number of years worked, and interaction between gender and, and sector. Uh, this is the multiple linear regression model. Um, we use uh, these variables, years of service, male gender, uh, if the person uh, is in the uh, administrative sector or uh, faculty sector. Uh, the model explains uh, 57 uh, percent and all the variables are statistically significant at the 5 percent level. Uh, the, the, the direction of the VITAS, uh, years of service is positive and male gender is positive. The administrative sector and the interaction uh, was uh, is the negative uh, sign. Um, okay, and now uh, we present the interaction between male gender and job sector. Uh, in this figure, uh, we note that the venture that men's salary generally have tends to be re reversed in the case of the administrative sector, controlling for all uh, other uh, variables. Um, if we uh, uh, make a distribution of salaries, uh, this is the dependent variable. We can see a symmetric distribution. Uh, salaries tend to accumulate in the left tail, as shown in, in, in the figure. And quarter regression models were run to verify that the data began similar in each quartile. And we uh, do the quantile regression model. Um, the direction of, of, the, of the betas in each quartile are equal to the multiple linear regression model and the magnitude uh, is similar. Uh, the beta of the male um, gender variable is statistically significant for the quartile five and the quartile nine, um, and um, is partial significant in, in the quartile uh, two and the quartile uh, is the eight. And the uh, all all the all variables, uh, years of service and a uh, uh, male gender, um, no excuse me, and sector laboral and uh, the interaction are a uh, uh, significant uh, statistical significant for all for each quartile. Okay, uh, finally, I, I talk about the main conclusion. The analysis showed the salary system of the University of Costa Rica exhibits gender inequalities with different patterns in the administrative and faculty sector. The explanation for the result is not tri trivial. However, it can be assumed that in the administrative sector, there is greater scope for salary growth linked to stereotypes about the tasks that should be performed by men and women. 
does some professional positions such as uh, administrative managers are culturally represent as uh, feminine roles and does Chen uh, somehow benefit women who remain with these partners? On the other hand, no professional position, for example, maintenance and security are often uh, associated with mas masculine stereo 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 stereotypes. In the case of the faculty sector, the situation is difficult to analyze because academic performance indicators were not included in the model due to difficult in, in obtaining data. For this re reason, subsequent analysis will have to be carried out to identify possible asymmetries, for example, in access to the academic regime. We are currently undertaking this analysis, but this process involves involves a several of technical difficulties that we need to overcome. And um, the, the finally conclusion, the system assume a hier hier hierarchy position in which various categories constitute negative positive poles, such as interim permanent administrative faculty. It is interesting to note that our analysis shows a tendency for women who access the highest hierarchy categories to receive fewer incentives than men who do so. On the other hand, a lower level of hierar hierarchy, women have better condition than men. Thus, the system seems to implicitly encourage men to claim within this model, but it also seems to encourage women's tendency not to advance up the ladder. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Henia. So because we are um, out of time, so uh, there is no chance of questions. So if someone has... Uh, someone wants to ask something we will be happy to yeah to to share the the emails of the speakers um so once again thank you uh, everybody uh, in this session and of course again thank you to the organizers um